بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد uh, Welcome uh, all of you to our first program uh, for the sisters Inshallah ta'ala the first of many many programs that we're going to have for the sisters uh, And we pray and hope that inshallah ta'ala these series of classes are a source of inspiration And a source of uh, education and a source of knowledge and spirituality for all of us we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with sincerity uh, and with uh, beneficial knowledge and that we're able to act upon that knowledge. Uh, since this is an introductory class, we're eventually going to start a series of classes, a silsila or a series of lectures. Since this is an introductory class, I thought that one of the good ways to start this class is to discuss the qualities, the merits, the biographies, the blessings uh, of perhaps the greatest woman whom we have detailed information about and that is Khadija binti Khuwaylid the very first wife of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Khadija as you all know Khadija was the most beloved wife to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is actually not easy to find information about her and the reason for this is many I mean there's many reasons that it's difficult to find narrations about Khadija of them is that, believe it or not, you would think that uh, some people would have written books in the classical times about Khadija. In fact, they didn't do so. Rather, what they did was that they wrote books about all of the companions and of them was also Khadija. So we don't have specialized books in early Islam, big volumes about Khadija uh, binti Khuwaylid. But one of the main reasons why we don't have much information about Khadija was because she died a very early death. She died in the early stages of the prophetic message. She didn't migrate to Medina. And most of the narrations that we have of the Meccan Sirah are actually very limited in number. Even though the Meccan Sirah is actually 40 years before the prophecy and 13 years after the prophecy, that is 53 years of the life of the Prophet The majority of the Sirah involves the Meccan era. And yet, the number of narrations we have about this era is very dismal compared to the Madani era. The reason for this in Mecca, the Muslims were small. They were persecuted. Their quantity was little. Who had time to collect information? Who had time to write history books? Who had time to narrate about the life and times of the Muslims? Also, they're in a situation of humiliation. In this situation, you have to get by. You're not worried about a future history. In Medina, the Muslims are in honor, in izza, in glory. They have strength, they have quantity, they have quality. And so people are uh, writing, people are narrating. Uh, the number of companions is much more in Medina. And so because also it's much more, and also they're younger companions, they live a longer time. The majority of companions never saw the Meccan phase. They were either emigrants to Medina or they were born in Medina. They were the Ansar. So who's going to narrate about Khadija when they haven't been there? And the third reason why we have very little information about Khadija is because naturally the societies of that time, like the societies of our time, were segregated. And therefore information about women is more difficult to obtain than information about men. If something happened to the Prophet in public in Mecca, then there's going to be 50 men seeing this. But how about Khadija and the Prophet having a private conversation? How about Khadija supporting the Prophet wasallam, consoling him? Who will be a witness to this? Who will narrate this? Obviously, hardly anybody. And therefore, all that we have about Khadija is various tidbits here and there. And what we can try to do is to form a more comprehensive picture about this great and magnificent lady. Who is Khadija binti Khuwaylid? What is her lineage and who is her tribal, what is her tribal affiliation? We need to understand from the beginning that the Quraysh, of course, was one major tribe in Mecca. What a lot of people don't realize, the Quraysh itself is composed of many sub-tribes. It's not just one tribe. Quraysh is one, it's like America has 50, 50 plus states, right? When you say you're from America, if you say this to a foreigner, they'll say, okay, fine. But if you're within America, where are you from in America? Are you from Tennessee? Are you from Texas? And then you narrow it down more and more. Well, similarly with the Quraysh, they have a large tribe of the Quraysh. And then they have various sub-tribes. So the sub-tribe that our Prophet belonged to was what? Who can tell me? What is the sub-tribe of our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam? Everybody should know this. The Banu, no, not the Quraysh. The Quraysh is the major tribe. The Banu Hashim, the Hashimites, right? The Banu Hashim. This is the sub-tribe of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
Khadija did not belong to this sub-tribe of Banu Hashim. She belonged to another sub-tribe. And her ancestry connects with that of the Prophet ﷺ in the sixth or seventh generation. So she is six or seven generations removed from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you want to know the details, Khadija bint Khuwaylid ibn Asad ibn Abdul Uzza ibn Qusay ibn Kilab. Kilab, this same Kilab, he is also the ancestor of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu ancestry is, actually I should quiz you, who can possibly narrate to me the Prophet Sallallahu ancestry up to Kilab? Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn no Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn silence <laughs> Muhammad ibn Qusay very good ibn actually no you're missing somebody Hashim was the son of Abdi Manaf Abdi Manaf ibn Qusay ibn Kilab this is the Kilab okay let me repeat once again this is the lineage of our Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib that's the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ibn Hashim this is the Banu Hashim that's the famous Banu Hashim Ibn Abdi Manaf Ibn Qusay Ibn Kilab right so this is the same Kilab that is the ancestor of uh, the, the mother of the believers Khadija Khadija's mother her name was Fatima binti Zaida and she was from the tribe of the Banu Asad so Khadija is basically a pure Qurashi she's purely from the tribe of Quraysh Khadija had a very famous family. Her brothers, her father, they were all very famous. She had a number of very, very famous brothers. Of them is Awam. And Awam was the father of one of the most famous companions, Zubayr ibn al-Awam. The famous companion Zubayr ibn al-Awam and Zubayr married, who did Zubayr marry? Who can tell me? Asma, right? So Zubayr ibn al-Awam, Asma is who? You're all now confused. <laughs> Aisha's sister, yes. Zubayr ibn al-Awwam, the Prophet said, every single Prophet has a disciple. And my disciple is Zubayr. Zubayr is the nephew of Khadija. Awam is the brother of Khadija. Another brother of Khadija is Hizam. Hizam, he had also a very famous son, Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam was also a famous Sahabi. So here we have two of the nephews of Khadija who are very famous Sahaba. Now Hizam himself and Awam, they were, uh, they, they, they were killed before the coming of Islam. They didn't accept Islam. But Hakim ibn Hizam and Zubayr ibn al-Awam, these two are Sahaba. Hakim, another nephew, he has a very interesting story of birth. His mother uh, was pregnant with him and she was visiting the Kaaba and she actually entered the Kaaba and she began her labor pains inside the Kaaba and they were so severe that she laid down inside the Kaaba and so Hakim ibn Hizam was given birth inside the Kaaba as far as we know this is the only person in the history of humanity who was born inside the Kaaba and that is Hakim ibn Hizam and this is the uh, the nephew of Aisha and Hakim ibn Hizam was one of the prominent Sahaba the Prophet ﷺ praised him uh, immensely and the Prophet ﷺ sent him as an emissary and he used him a lot and he, Hakim ibn Hizam was that person when the Prophet ﷺ entered Mecca as the conqueror of Mecca Remember that uh, he gave an announcement that whoever is inside the Kaaba shall be safe. Whoever is in the, inside the house of Abu Sufyan shall be safe. And he mentioned four or five houses, that's it. One of the houses he mentioned is that of Hakim ibn Hizam. And this is the nephew of Khadija. Whoever is inside the house of Hakim ibn Hizam shall be safe. Hakim ibn Hizam uh, lived one of the longest lives of the Sahaba. He died when he was 120 years old. And most of our information about Khadija and about early Meccan history comes from Hakim ibn Hizam. Why? Because imagine most of the Sahaba from Medina. Imagine Anas ibn Malik. Imagine Jabir. Imagine even Abu Huraira. They never saw Mecca. They weren't around when Mecca happened, right? They accepted Islam later on. They are all a part of Medina. Who can tell you what happens in Mecca? Most of the early Meccan converts, either they died in Badr, they died in Uhud, or they died early deaths, maybe in the time of Abu Bakr, Umar. So they didn't get to live a long time to narrate the stories of Khadija and of other people. Most of what we know about Khadija and about early Mecca it comes from a few companions of them is Hakim ibn Hizam. Uh, 
the, the father of all of these famous people, Hizam and Awam and Khadija, Khadija binti Khuwaylid. Khuwaylid, Khuwaylid was a beloved merchant of Mecca and he was the chief of the tribe of the Banu Asad. So Khadija is from the sub-tribe of Banu Asad. We said the Prophet is from the tribe of Banu Hashim. Khadija is from the sub-tribe of the Banu Asad. So the Banu Asad and the Banu Hashim, they are cousin tribes within the broader tribe of Quraysh. Khadija was the daughter of the chieftain of the Banu Asad. And in old, in the days of Jahiliyyah of old, being the chieftain, being the, the main person, just like Abdul Muttalib is the chieftain, right? Automatically his children and grandchildren, their prestige is raised up. Similarly, Khadija, because her father is the chieftain, he is the main person of the Banu Asad, their lineage is raised up. In our times, lineage has become very secondary. It's not that big of a deal. Still, we have remnants of the importance of lineage, but by and large, it's something that we have neglected. Uh, very little, little bit only ethnicities counts. Where are you from? Which village are you from? When somebody proposes to another, uh, another person, still sometimes the elders want to know what is their lineage, who is their parents, which, which area of the world they are from. In those days, lineage was everything. In our times, primarily it's money. In those days, lineage was everything, more important than money. And that is why if you were from a famous lineage, you, could, you had a lot more power, your prestige went up, only people of status would then propose to you and for you. All of this depended on your lineage. Her tribe of the Banu Asad was known for its inquisitiveness, its, its theological inquisitiveness. Each one of the sub-tribes is characterized by some characteristics. So the Banu Hashim is known for taking care of the, uh, the people coming to Mecca, the Siqaya. They would take care of the people coming to Mecca, they would give them water, they were in charge of the Zamzam. Uh, so the Banu Asad, they were known for being inquisitive, being open-minded. And of the evidences for this, two of Khadija's cousins had rejected idolatry and had decided to worship Allah alone. And this, is a very, and this is before the coming of Islam. So this is a very strange thing for pre-Islamic society to reject idolatry and to worship Allah alone. Khadija had two of her cousins, immediate relatives, first cousins. They both rejected jahiliyyah, they rejected paganism, and they decided to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And this was before the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of those cousins you are all aware of, and he is Waraqa ibn Nawfal ibn Asad. And Khadija, her name is Khadija binti Khuwaylid ibn Asad. The same Asad. Waraqa ibn Nawfal ibn Asad, Khadija binti Khuwaylid ibn Asad. So their grandfather is the same. This makes them first cousins. So their fathers are brothers. So the first cousins. So Waraqa is Khadija's first cousin. And as you know the story of Waraqa, and Waraqa's cousin, and Khadija's cousin, his name is Uthman ibn al-Huwayrith ibn Asad. Same Asad, Uthman ibn al-Huwayrith ibn Asad. Their story is interesting, I'll summarize it very briefly. And that was around 20 years before the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the Prophet was probably a teenager, probably 17 years old, 18 years old. At that time, the Jahili Arabs of Quraysh had a very big festival. And all of the people of Mecca, they left to go to the festival. And it was a grand festival, it was their Eid. They all left and the city was absolutely empty, except for a handful of men who remained behind. Of these men was Waraqa ibn Nawfal, and of them was Uthman ibn al huwayrith and of them was uh, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayr, and, and uh, a fourth man. These four, when they saw that their people had left and they secretly remained behind, they understood that all four of them did not want to be a part of the pagan festival. In other words, they felt something wrong with this paganism. And so they decided to remain behind, but they're too embarrassed to tell anybody else. When everybody leaves, they're the only people in the city, they all have exposed themselves to each other. And they know now that us four, we are different. So they open up, they become good friends. They open up to each other and they begin talking about the evils of paganism. And so each one decides to research the truth. Each one decides to go out and find what is the real religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Waraqa ibn Nawfal becomes 
just this, let's just call it somebody between a Jew and a Christian, a Judeo-Christian. Uthman ibn al-Huwaydith accepts Christianity. Uh, the third of them also accepts Christianity. And Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, he said, all religions are wrong. I don't agree with Christianity or Judaism or uh, paganism. I am going to follow the religion of the Prophet Ibrahim. And I will not worship any idols and I will worship Allah alone. These are the four people who were known to have rejected Islam, uh, rejected, sorry, Jahiliyyah before the coming of Islam. And these four, two of them were from the tribe of Banu Asad, i.e. the immediate family of Khadija. So it's no surprise that Khadija is coming from a very open-minded, very inquisitive tribe. And she is of the first, in fact, the very first person to accept Islam, as we know. Khadija had been married twice before in the days of Jahiliyyah. Uh, and both of her husbands had uh, died. According to one report, one of them died and one of them divorced her. According to another report, both of them died. The first husband of hers was Abu Hind. Abu Hind. And this marriage resulted in uh, two sons, Hind and Hala. And the second marriage was to Atiq ibn Abid al-Makhzumi. And this did not lead to any children. So Khadija had two boys, two sons, Hind and Hala. Even though Hala uh, in our times is primarily a girl's name, but Hala was also a boy's name in that time. And so Hind and Hala uh, were both sons of Khadija. It is also rumored that she had other children uh, from the second husband, but the people have differed about that. We don't have any reference of them. So most likely she only had two of, uh, of the sons. And the most famous of them is Hind. Hind accepted Islam along with his mother Khadija. We don't know much about Hala. Uh, whether he accepted Islam or not. Hind accepted Islam along with his mother and he died a shaheed in one of the battles after uh, the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now Khadija, because of the death of her two husbands, it appears that these marriages left her a very wealthy woman, especially the marriage of her second husband Atiq. Because they didn't have any children and Atiq apparently did not have any brothers. So when Atiq died, all of her money was then, in, all of his money was then inherited by Khadija. And we learn from this that Khadija became the wealthiest single lady in all of Mecca. She became the richest lady in all of Mecca. And on top of that, she is the daughter of the chieftain of the Banu Asad. And in those days, being the daughter of the chieftain and being wealthy, this meant everything. This is the most important thing for a marriage. And this made her, as Ibn Ishaq says, the most desirable lady of Mecca. She was the one that all of the suitors would be interested in. But she herself, after having been married twice, she did not apparently have, see any need to get married again until as we will come to uh, the Prophet wasallam. Now Khadija, as we said, had been left with a lot of money. And she is one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest lady of all of Mecca. And this also shows us that we know that Jahili society did not allow women to rise up. We know that Jahili society put women down. They had killed daughters at birth. They would not allow women to inherit the general rule. Nonetheless, once in a while, it would happen that a woman would inherit money, such as the case of Khadija. And so it's not as if it was a blanket rule that no woman could ever do anything. In the story of Khadija, we learn that even in Jahili society, women had a place and status, not anywhere close to what they had after Islam, but still Khadija is earning her own money, and she controls her money, and she is an independent lady. So there is some room for independence even in Jahili society. Uh, Khadija being a woman with a lot of money, actually had a negative side to that as well. And that, is, that was that people tried to swindle her and take advantage of her. How so? Because she cannot undertake business herself. It's a man's world out there. She cannot go to the marketplace and buy and sell. She cannot travel uh, like other people travel to go for, uh, for, for business. So what she would have to do is she would find a business manager who had to be a male. And this business manager, she would give him money, 10,000 gold coins here. You go and buy, let's say, uh, leather, or you buy spices, or you buy trade. And then you go sell it, let's say, in Syria. You will go sell it in Syria. And then you buy other goods from Syria, and then come back, and I will give you a percentage of this profit. Now, can you imagine in those days, there is no record keeping. These are all illiterate people. 
uh, Khadija could not read or write as well. There's no, there's no computerized mechanized system of seeing what the inventory or stock is. It goes without saying, whoever she found turned out to be an evil person, a fraudster, a trickster who would take a large percentage. Many times Khadija would be left with hardly anything. Many times it would be a bare minimum of profit. And Khadija understood and realized that this was a very delicate situation to be in. How can she find it? If the man comes and says, oh, it was a very tough business year. I couldn't sell this item except for uh, 10, 10 gold coins and it's worth 50 gold coins. How does Khadija know what happens in Syria? How does Khadija know what is, if this man is pocketing 40 gold coins and giving her back only 10? Khadija has no way of finding out. And so for a number of years, Khadija kept on getting uh, swindled. She kept on getting, uh, if you like, short changed. And this was what led her to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did she find out about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Khadija has a sister and her sister was also called Hala. So her nephew, her, her son is called Hala and her sister is called Hala. There are some names in the Arabic language to this day, they apply to men and women. And so Hala is one of those names. So Hala has a, a uh, Khadija has a sister, her name is Hala. Hala owns some sheep. She owns some sheep. And in the course of finding a shepherd for her sheep, she heard of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As you all know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was a very young man, when he was a teenager, the very first job that he found was that of a shepherd. He would literally go and take uh, the, these sheep, these goats, and he would go outside of the city of Mecca and find pasture for them and come back and he would be given copper coins, what we, what we now call pennies and cents. He would be given some copper coins. I mean, how much are you going to pay a shepherd? It's literally just walking out, finding grass and coming back. A lot of manual labor, but it doesn't require a skilled person to do it. But it does require a patient person. And the Prophet ﷺ learned to be patient by becoming a shepherd. And in one hadith he said, every single prophet whom Allah ever sent used to be a shepherd. Because being a shepherd teaches you to be patient, teaches you to take care of uh, the flock, it teaches you to, to look after each and every person in the community. And so the Prophet ﷺ became a shepherd for a number of years. During the course of being a shepherd, so Hala finds out that there is a person who is taking care of sheep and that's the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so she negotiates with the Prophet Sallallahu and he had a co-worker as well we don't know his name he had a co-worker he had two people uh, that uh, that were working with him sorry he had one person working with him so they were a team of two people if you like a little corporation a little business of two people so Hala agrees with these two people one of whom is the Prophet Sallallahu to go out with her uh, sheep and they do this for a number of times they they take out for a number of days a number of weeks until finally it time is come to pay them for their efforts so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his companion he said to him uh, the companion said let us go collect our wages it's time for our paycheck to come the Prophet Sallallahu said why don't you go and collect it on my behalf I am shy to approach her in other words she's a woman and I don't want to approach her why don't you go and take my wages and then give it to me later on so the man came alone to Hala Hala said where is your companion in other words I hired the two of you I should pay you half and pay him half so he said he was too shy to come and he instructed me to collect his wages and I will give it to him at this Hala said I have never seen a more perfect gentleman and a more uh, modest and shy man than your companion, i.e. the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And it so happened that Khadija was sitting there at this time when this transaction is taking place. And that was the first time that she heard such noble praises of this human being, our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And the first time something entered her heart about uh, him. Slowly but surely the uh, word spreads that the Prophet ﷺ is a very trustworthy person. And he is, as you all know, he was called Al-Amin in Mecca. You all know this. And so the word spreads that he is a very honest person. And so Khadija sends a message to the Prophet ﷺ saying that, I have heard that you are a very honest man and I have a business proposal, a business transaction for you. Why don't you take my caravan to Syria and I shall give you one third of the Prophet. In other words, 
you just be the business manager. You be the business manager, you buy and sell, and you will get one third of the profit. Now imagine here the Prophet is a shepherd, he's getting literally uh, pennies. This is now a business offer, maybe it's like $100,000, right? Imagine this is a, a massive difference. I mean, from, from being a shepherd to becoming a CEO of a company. That's literally the jump that, that he is being given. The Prophet is so excited, he rushes home to Abu Talib, and he says, oh my uncle, so and so Khadija has given me a business uh, offer. Do you think I should accept it or not? And Abu Talib tells him, of course my son, she is a noble lady and uh, inshallah ta'ala, you will get much money from this endeavor. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted uh, this offer and he took the caravan. According to one report, uh, Khadija also sent her personal uh, slave and servant Maysara as well with him. And Maysara came back Firstly, the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, because not only was he the most honest and the most trustworthy, but also because of his manners and akhlaq, also because Allah blessed him, he made a huge profit, the likes of which no other uh, manager had ever made before. He made the largest profit that any manager had ever made before. Not only that, but because he's so honest, he comes and he gives Khadija, obviously, down to a penny, the full two-thirds, and he accepts the one-third. Right? So Khadija, maybe she's getting 5,000, 10,000 gold coins every year. Now she gets 80,000, 100,000 gold coins. She gets a massive amount of money. And Maysara comes back and he cannot stop talking about his companion, about the Prophet ﷺ. He cannot stop praising how gentle he was, how fair he was, how honest he was. And there are even reports that Maysara said that wherever he went, there was a cloud above him and this happened and that happened. So, so many reports. Now, obviously, Khadija is now uh, very much, if you like, uh, interested and, uh, uh, and there's no question, and some of you might feel um, strange for me to say this, but there's nothing at all to say that she had some feelings for our Prophet Wasallam. This is a part of being a human being, that it is natural to have uh, feelings for somebody else. It's natural to have uh, uh, attraction in such a scenario and situation. And there's nothing haram whatsoever. There's nothing makruh whatsoever in speaking like this. Khadija obviously felt an inclination. She felt the beginnings of, 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 of a love for the Prophet Wasallam, And so, she hinted to another servant of hers. And by the way, the very fact that she has so many servants that we read about clearly shows her status. She's not like an average lady. She has Maysara, she has Nafisa, uh, and that was her second servant, Nafisa. Uh, she also has uh, Zayd, who was to become uh, uh, the, the, the quote-unquote adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ. This used to belong to Khadija. And when, uh, I'm jumping the gun here, but when she eventually married the Prophet ﷺ, one of the gifts she gave him was she gifted him Zayd as her slave as a, a strong man, Zayd, to be the personal assistant. And the first thing the Prophet did was he freed Zayd. He just made him a free man. Uh, and then eventually he adopted him, as you all know. And then Allah Azza wa Jal prohibited adoption, but he remained very close to the Prophet till his death. So much so, again, I'm jumping the gun here and going a different tangent. So much so, when Zayd's father came and Zayd's uncle came to try to collect Zayd because Zayd had been kidnapped as a child. Zayd had been kidnapped by a tribe and sold into slavery. He was not a slave by birth. He was a free man by birth. So when his father and uncle finally heard where Zayd is and they tracked him down to Mecca and they came back and they had a lot of money and they knocked on the door of the Prophet and they said, Zayd is our son and he was kidnapped and so on and so on and so forth. Here is this money. If you can sell him back to us, we will free him. The Prophet said, he's not a slave. He's a free man. It's up to him what he wants to do. And so Zayd comes out. He sees his father. He's emotional and whatnot. But then his father says, come back to me. And Zayd says, I'd rather stay with the Prophet ﷺ. And he voluntarily chose to not go back to his family and be in the household of the Prophet ﷺ. And that was when the Prophet ﷺ adopted him. When he gave up, if you like, going back to his family, the Prophet ﷺ adopted him. And then in Medina, Allah revealed, don't call them by your names, call them by their fathers. Uh, and so that adoption was repealed. I jumped the gun, let's get back to the story of Khadija. Khadija, where were we? So Khadija now sees the immense amount of... Uh, wealth and the honesty and the akhlaq and the blessings coming from our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and like any shy woman, she cannot obviously uh, propose directly but she hints, some people, some versions say it was a close friend, other versions say it was a servant and her name was Nafisa. Uh, she hints to Nafisa that what a 
uh, handsome and young man this is and would it not be good if he found a, a good wife for him now obviously she is a single lady and she would not be speaking about a man unless she herself is interested so Khadija get, uh, Nafisa gets the point and so it is says that Nafisa uh, visited the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and of course, this is before the time of any Islam, any laws of Islam. So there's no hijab. Women are visiting men. There's no issue uh, Islamically about that because Islam hasn't come yet. And so Nafisa visits the Prophet ﷺ and says, you are a, a young man. You should be looking for a wife. Why don't you find a wife? And the Prophet ﷺ said, who, who will possibly marry me? I'm a shepherd. I'm living in my uncle's house. To this point in time, the Prophet ﷺ did not even have his own apartment, his own house he's living in the roof of, under the roof of Abu Talib so he's saying who would possibly want to marry me I cannot afford a wife what woman of the Quraysh would want to give herself up you know and live in, in dire and abject poverty with me and Nafisa says what if that woman would be Khadija what if Khadija would be interested in this and she wants to see the response of the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Sallallahu said and why would Khadija be interested in me? In other words, he didn't say, I'm not interested in that type of lady. Rather, he put it back to her. Why would Khadija be interested in me? So when he said this, Nafisa understood that the Prophet ﷺ did not have any problem with Khadija. That's what she wanted to hear. That the Prophet ﷺ is open to the prospect of Khadija uh, basically marrying him. If he had said, oh, I, I cannot marry her because of this, because of that, that would have been the end of that. But she put it back to her. He put it back to her and he said, why would somebody like Khadija from such a noble family, so rich and so well off, why would she be interested in basically the shepherd uh, uh, living in the house of his uncle? Why would she possibly be interested in someone like me? And so when this was basically uh, uh, said, Nafisa immediately went back and uh, Khadija uh, was then officially betrothed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The marriage took place in the house of Khadija and the Prophet's uncles Abu Talib and Hamza they were the ones who took charge of the uh, marriage Khadija's father had passed away some of you might have possibly heard of a story of involving Khadija and her father and it's not a very appropriate story it says that she put made him drunk by giving him extra wine because he wouldn't agree this story is fabricated it is not authentic the more authentic version is that uh, Khadija's father had already passed away. Khuwaylid is already dead at this time. And so he cannot possibly be in the picture. Rather Khadija's uncle, Amr ibn Asad, he was the one who took charge from his side. And uh, the Prophet's uncles, uh, Abu Talib and also Hamza, they were the ones who took charge of that uh, uh, of the Prophet ﷺ side. And from this, by the way, the scholars have said, now I don't want to cause a big controversy here, but the fact of the matter is, it is permissible for a sister to express an interest in a brother uh, in appropriate manner for the issue of marriage like Khadija did. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it is done within the appropriate ways. Khadija didn't just walk into the house of the Prophet and said, do you love me? Can I marry you? She didn't do that, right? She went about a very indirect way, a very, very clean, very decent, very beautiful way. And this is something that uh, Islamically is completely permissible if all of the other conditions are met. Now, uh, the Prophet uh, married Khadija in her own house, in the house of Khadija, and he began then living in her house. So the Prophet moved from the house of Abu Talib to the house of Khadija. And in the book of Ibn uh, Sirah of Ibn Ishaq, it mentions that Khadija uh, sacrificed a cow for the Walima. And sacrificing a cow in Mecca is a very, very big deal. And this shows us the stature of Khadija. Uh, a cow is not a cheap animal, especially in the desert region of Mecca. And we can show that uh, and we can from this infer that this was a very large feast. There are no fridges in Mecca. You're not going to be able to keep the meat for 5-10 days. That means the cow is consumed right then and there. That means at least 200 people, 300 people were invited. And this is a huge feast. And from this we can derive that pretty much the entire city of Mecca was invited and the Prophet ﷺ began living in the house of Khadija these were the only two houses he lived in in Mecca the house of Abu Talib and then the house of Khadija the immigration the Hijra it occurred from the house of Khadija he, he himself ﷺ, did not have his own house because he marries a very wealthy lady and so her house becomes his house the um, there's one interesting point here and that is that 
scholars have differed about the age of Khadija at the time of marriage. Now I know that all of us here have heard that Khadija was 40 years old. And this is something that uh, one of the early books of Sirah does mention. However, and this is, I don't want to get too academic here, but nonetheless, there are other books of Sirah written in the same time frame. And another book of Sirah mentions that uh, she was not 40, she was 28 years old. She was 28 years old. Specifically, it says 28 years old. So there's two reports. One that says she was 40 and one that says she was 28. And Ibn Abbas, the famous companion of the Prophet he is the one who says that when the Prophet married Khadija, she was 28 years old. In my humble opinion, the fact that she had at least six, maybe eight children with the Prophet wasallam, kind of sort of suggests that she was not 40. It is very difficult for a woman of 40 to have six or seven or eight children, especially in those days. Whereas if she were 28, then it makes it much more reasonable to have six or eight children. In my humble opinion, this seems to be the stronger uh, narration. Nonetheless, we use the fact that she was 40 to say that the Prophet married an older lady who was twice widowed with kids. All of that is still the same. She was an older lady. She was twice widowed. She had children. So all of that remains the same. The only thing is we move the age from 42 uh, to 28. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. We don't have any information at all about the early years of the marriage, about any issues here and there, except for one or two very small reports. One of these reports is that uh, one of the neighbors of the Prophet sallallahu reported many, many years later that he once heard not an argument, but rather the Prophet raising his voice in his house. Now in those days, you know, the houses were not miles apart like we have, mashallah. You know, the houses were literally connected to each other. There's no massive garden in the middle. The wall that is one side is your house, the other side will be the house of the neighbor, right? And they still have this in many places in Europe. They call them the terraced housing, i.e. every single house is connected to the other house. And the wall is a thin wall and it's made out of clay or, 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 or uh, mud. And so it's not a very thick massive wall. So basically if the, somebody raises their voice you can hear it. So in one book of Sirah we learned that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, one day for some reason became agitated and he raised his voice. What did he say? He said, Wallahi O Khadija, I can never worship Allah and Al Uzza. Wallahi, I cannot worship Allah and Al Uzza. This is what he's getting irritated about, that he does not want to worship these false gods, Allah and Al Uzza. And the neighbor reports that Khadija is trying to calm him down and saying, Leave Allah alone, leave Al Uzza alone. Don't worry about Allah and Al Uzza. Perhaps it might have been the case that some of his uncles, some of the society pressured the Prophet to take part in some type of festival and he did not want to participate. And of course, we know that he never ever worshipped an idol in his life. And so he comes home very agitated, uh, very uh, uh, concerned, and he's angry, and he says, I am not going to worship Allah and Al-Uzza, and Khadija is calming him down, consoling him. Don't worry about Allah, leave Allah alone, leave Al-Uzza alone, don't worry about them. So automatically we see and we, we get a sense of the relationship that, would be, that Khadija and the Prophet would have, and that is that as any man, when society puts pressure on him, he will come home in a little bit of an angry mood, a little bit of pressure mood, and Khadija diffuses the situation. Khadija calms him down. And that is exactly the relationship that we know the Prophet ﷺ had with Khadija. Now, one of the things that Khadija's marriage did with the Prophet ﷺ was that it allowed the Prophet ﷺ to free up his time for better activities for more important activities. And that is because there is no doubt that when a man has to earn a living and he's working 10-15 uh, hours a day, then he cannot do other things with his time. And the fact that he marries Khadija, now his living is taken care of. And Khadija is, mashallah, a very wealthy lady. So just working a few hours a day, he can get all of the uh, sustenance and all of the uh, money that he needs. Therefore, this gives him more time to be a part of the community. And it was during his marriage to Khadija where he resolved the dispute about building the Kaaba, as you all know. It was during his marriage to Khadija where other events took place that he took part of. So it's obvious he has more time in society now after his marriage to Khadija. Also, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, as we all know, Alam Nashrah Halaka Sadak, sorry, wa wajadaka aailan fa agna, wa wajadaka aailan fa agna. We found you without any money, aailan fa agna. We gave you plenty of money. 
Some of the scholars of the past said, we gave you plenty of money by causing you to be married to Khadija. فَأَغْنَى Through your marriage to Khadija. So Allah Azza wa references this in the Quran indirectly, that Allah has everything willed for a plan. It was the divine plan of Allah that the Prophet ﷺ marry a noble lady, a wealthy lady like Khadija, a lady of maturity and wisdom, not a young lady who was immature and would not be able to help the Prophet ﷺ, but a lady who was very mature. For her age, she had experienced already uh, two marriages, she already has children, she's a wise lady who's already been uh, a businessman, always is a wiser person than an average person, because he has to guard his money. So Khadija is a businesswoman and she already knows that people are the nature of men, the nature of people to, to trick her out. And so Khadija is already a very mature lady for her age. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, we found you poor, we gave you money, i.e. through your marriage to Khadija. And it is also narrated then that as time went on, the Prophet ﷺ became more restless with the status of society. He wanted a change, he wanted a dramatic change, he wanted a theological change. And so he would leave Mecca, as we all know the story, and he would sit in the cave of Hira, Ghari Hira. He would sit in the cave of Hira. And Ghari Hira was on the mountain, which is now called Jabal An Nur. Back then it was not called Jabal An Nur, it is called Jabal An Nur because Nur came down, i.e., the Quran came down. Before that it was not called Jabal An Nur, but the mountain was called Mount, the, the Mount of Hira. Uh, the, the cave was called, sorry, the cave was called the cave of Hira. So our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He wanted a place to be away from the uh, hustle and bustle of society. He wanted a place to contemplate. And men by their nature, they like to have a little bit of seclusion. They like to have peace and quiet and, and to think and to contemplate. And this is one of the big differences between men and women, psychological differences. Women by their nature, they like to resolve their emotions by talking, by, by talking it through. Women, men by their nature, they like to figure their emotions out by being quiet by finding a quiet place, by letting their thoughts uh, come out. That's why when the man is in a uh, tough situation, he withdraws, he becomes quiet. When the woman is in a tough situation, she talks out. And from a man's perspective, she becomes emotional. But from her perspective, this is how she's dealing with that emotion. She's bringing it out and she's talking about it. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to be away from society. He wanted to get out from the uh, the, 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 all of the hustle and bustle of society. So he would withdraw physically to the cave of Hira. Now the cave of Hira, it's actually at least a two hour walk from the Kaaba. It's pretty far away. And some books have said that this cave was discovered by Abdul Muttalib. And Abdul Muttalib himself would use it as his private place. And so Abdul Muttalib's immediate family, i.e. the Prophet ﷺ, hears about this, that there's a nice beautiful cave uh, in the mountain there. And what this does, it provides shelter in the middle of the night. You need a, a roof over your head. You need a little bit of a warmth there. And so the Prophet ﷺ would live in this cave for a few days, maybe even up to a week. And he would live there uh, just to contemplate. Now we don't know what he did. All that we know, he had some type of worship that he used to do. What that was, we'll never know. Nobody was there to tell us except for Khadija, as we'll come to. And neither of them, neither the Prophet nor Khadija told us any details of what he would do in that cave. But he would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even before Wahi came down. Somehow he would worship him and he would think about the creation. And he would think about the corruption of society of idolatry and how to solve that. And Khadija... When the Prophet ﷺ would not come back for a few days, she would go up to the mountain top. She would climb all the way. Has any of you amongst you climbed mountain Hira, Ghara Hira? One person. How long did it take you to go up? At least two hours. At least two hours. From the base. From the, base. Yeah. From the Kaaba to the base is at least an hour. Okay. So Khadija would then undertake this journey alone from her house to the top of the mountain, in our times it takes around two hours for, and by the way, that two hours, because the path is well, well put out. Now there's staircase, right? Back in the day, there was no staircase. There was literally climbing up a mountain, literally climbing up a mountain. Now Khadija in her, and this really shows us the love that she has. The Prophet ﷺ would take some food, some water, and he goes and he sits there. And he's thinking now, okay, I will, I will take this food and water for let's say five days, right? Khadija, she gets worried. Maybe the food will run out. Maybe the water will run out. And so every once in a while, she would go. She would go. And she would deliver food and water to the Prophet ﷺ. And really this shows us the extreme amount of love that she had for our Prophet 
Firstly, any husband leaving the house will get any wife angry, correct? Any husband leaving the house will get the wife angry. Again, you're going, you just went. Why are you going again? Secondly, leaving for multiple nights. Now he's leaving for four, five, six nights. Instead of going and complaining to him, why are you not back home? What are you doing still outside, right? Instead of going and complaining, she in fact sends more food and water. And she allows him that space that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants. And Wallahi, this shows not just her maturity, but also her immense love for the Prophet Sallallahu that she wanted him to have this peace and this serenity. And then he would come home, spend some time with the family, get, get the affairs of the day and take care of the business, whatnot, and then go again. This occurred before the wahi came down. And you can tell that something is about to happen. And then of course, as we all know, we don't have to go into the story of Iqra. You all know the story of Iqra, that Jibreel came down in that particular and the, the, uh, the verses of the Quran are revealed, you all know that the Prophet ﷺ became completely terrified because this is he's all alone in the cave. I mean, this is literally in the middle of nowhere. You cannot see a human being. The cave is like a kind of secret cave, like nobody knows about it, right? And then he sees this massive, huge being. He doesn't know what's going on. Am I sane? Am I, am I not? Literally, the Prophet ﷺ began to doubt his own sanity. That's what he himself said. I, I began doubting myself what is going on. And he becomes terrified to the extent that he becomes pale and he is shivering out of his fear. Very few of us have ever been terrified to that level where we start shivering out of fear. And the Prophet ﷺ became so scared and he's trembling that he climbed down the mountain as fast as he could. And as you all know, he ran back to his, uh, his house and he cried out to Khadija, Oh Khadija, zammiluni, zammiluni, cover me up, cover me up, I am cold. And Khadija covered him up and embraced him and calmed him down. Now what this really shows us, a man at a time of extreme distress like this, he wants comfort, he wants love, he wants to be hugged, he wants to be embraced, he wants somebody to, to calm him down. He goes to the person that will calm him down the most. That's why a child will run to the mother, because he wants that comfort. The Prophet ﷺ could have gone to Abu Talib, he could have gone to his father figure, Abu Talib is still alive, he could have gone to so many people, but there is only one person that he truly loves that much, that he wants comfort from, and that is his wife Khadija. And this shows us the, uh, the, the nature of our Prophet ﷺ, and really that of any man who is married uh, to a woman that he loves, any man, the, the number one person that will comfort him is his wife. The number one person that will comfort him is his wife, and here is our Prophet ﷺ running back to Khadija. Oh Khadija, zammiluni, zammiluni, cover me up, cover me up. And when he calms down and Khadija manages to calm him down, imagine for two hours he must be running back from the cave to his house. He's still pale, he's still trembling. Khadija calms him down. It's not the running that calms him down, it is his wife that calms him down. And when she covers him up, she asks him the story. What is the matter? Why, what happened? And he tells the whole story and he says, I'm worried, maybe I'm, uh, something's happening with me. The illusion is maybe I'm going, uh, you know, uh, basically losing my sanity. That's the, the indication that he himself says, I'm worried about myself, I'm seeing things I shouldn't see. Khadija says, Wallahi la yukhzik Allahu abada. Wallahi Allah will never cause you to be humiliated by insanity, by anything of this nature. Allah will never cause you to be humiliated. Indeed, إِنَّكَ لَتَصِلُ rahim. You fulfill the ties of kinship, and you take care of the orphan, and you are kind to the poor, and you help people in every single matter that they need. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Khadija is praising the Prophet ﷺ by reminding him of his noble qualities. Telling him, you are good to fulfill the ties of kinship, and you take care of the orphan, and you fulfill the needs of the, of the needy person. How can Allah ever cause you to go astray? I want you to understand, our Prophet ﷺ needs to be reminded of, if you like, the blessings of Allah. Who can possibly do that? His own wife Khadija. Our Prophet ﷺ is getting worried, what is going on here? Who can possibly console a Prophet of Allah? The wife of that Prophet, someone like Khadija. Wallahi, this is something that really it shows you the status of this lady. That here the Prophet has seen Jibreel and he's worried. And this, who is going to calm him down? His own wife. Reminding him of the mercy of Allah. Allah will not cause you to go astray. And this also shows us the iman that Khadija had in Allah even before the revelation comes down. She has so much yaqeen in Allah. Allah will not cause you to go astray. 
Allah will take care of us. That is, I mean, in, in some sense here, the, the Khadija is reaffirming the Iman of our Prophet And of course, this is in the very early stages. This is literally, he is a Prophet for a few hours. He doesn't even know he's a Prophet yet, literally, right? He doesn't even know. You all know the next stage. What does Khadija do? Again, look at the wisdom of Khadija. The Prophet is terrified. And by the way, I always say this when I talk to non-Muslims. If our Prophet billah, if he were a fraud, if he were a fake, billah, if he was a person lying, do you think he would go running to his wife and saying, oh my God, I don't know what happened to me? I mean, there are other cases, I don't want to mention uh, you know, now, but I mean, there are cases of people who pretend to be prophets in our times, right? Believe me, they don't go running to their wives crying. They don't. They make a bold announcement. Oh, an angel has come to me. Oh, this has happened. I have some tablets that I saw. Literally, there are people that in our times, they claim to be prophets. Or a hundred years ago, here in America, there was a man who claimed to be a prophet. And now there's a large group of following that he has. And he literally said, he came out brave and bold. And he said, I have seen the angel and I have these golden tablets. This is here in America, right? If you are a fraud, that's how you announce. But if you're a real man, you will actually be scared when you see something like this, right? That's a sign of sincerity. That's a sign that he truly was the prophet of Allah. That's not a, a plot that he's hatching, that I'm gonna now convince the people that I'm a prophet. He is genuinely scared. And he goes home, sallallahu alayhi wa running to his wife, because that is what a scared man does. And Khadija calms him down. Khadija takes him to her older cousin, Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Nawfal was Khadija's uncle, much older than her father. Nawfal was one of the oldest brothers, and her father was one of the youngest brothers. So the son of the oldest brother, Waraqa, was much older than Khadija, perhaps by 40 years. So Waraqa at this stage is in his 70s or 80s. He's a very old man. He's been a Judeo-Christian, a mixed match of what he was not quite a Jew or a Christian. He's been upon that religion for at least 30, 40 years. The incident that I told you about happened decades ago. And he is now... He has now learned how to read Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and he is now uh, perhaps the greatest scholar in all of Mecca. Nobody is more knowledgeable than him in all of Mecca and he is Khadija's first cousin. And so Khadija takes the Prophet ﷺ to her uncle, uh, her, sorry, her cousin Waraka. And once again, this shows us the intelligence of Khadija. What do you do? You go to a person of knowledge. You go to a person of knowledge. Khadija is the one who thinks, let's go and find out what's happening. And so she takes the Prophet ﷺ to her, unk, her, her cousin, Waraqa. And as you all know, uh, Waraqa explains to the Prophet ﷺ that you have seen the very keeper of secrets who came to Musa and Isa. This is the angel Jibreel and he has brought you the secret from Allah. And your people will eventually reject you and throw you out. And how I wish, Waraka says, as, as an old man, he beamed, his face became bright. He said, how I wish I was a young man now so that I could support you and follow you when your people persecute you. So the Prophet says, this is the first time he hears of a persecution. He says, will my own people persecute me? And Waraka says, no man has ever come with the message that you have come with, except that his own nation is the first to persecute him. And Waraka, uh, Waraka died shortly after that. Uh, another narration that we have, now of course from this we also know that Khadija was the very first convert to Islam. The very first convert to Islam was Khadija. Khadija, before any man, before any child, before any, there was no Abu Bakr, there is no Ali, the number one convert to Islam is Khadija. The very first person to testify that he was the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Khadija. And we also know that uh, Khadija and the Prophet sallallahu began praying from a very, very early uh, time. Uh, that uh, Jibreel came down and taught the Prophet ﷺ to pray. And there are stories that Ali came home and he saw and Ali was living in the house of Khadija and the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because when the Prophet ﷺ married Khadija, he wanted to repay back the favor that Abu Talib had done to take care of him. Abu Talib himself was a very poor man and Abu Talib had lots of sons. Still, he took on the Prophet ﷺ to take care of him like one of his own sons. So when the Prophet ﷺ became wealthy by marrying Khadija, he wanted to take the pressure off of Abu Talib. And so he allowed, or not adopted because Ali is his cousin, but he took care of Ali. And he made Ali live with him as if he's his own son. 
And so Ali radiallahu anhu was a very, very close person to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He literally grew up as a son in the household of Khadija and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is why we say that Ali was the first child to convert to Islam. Ali was a young child at the time, seven, eight years old. The first woman to convert was Khadija and the first child to convert was Ali and the first uh, freed slave to convert was Zayd and the first free man to convert was Abu Bakr. These are the first converts to Islam. Even though in my talks I actually say to be more academic, the first man to convert is Waraqa. But a lot of scholars just ignore and overlook him because he passed away at a very young, uh, at a, a very immediate age. Khadija, another blessing of Khadija was that Khadija is the only woman whom the Prophet ﷺ had children with amongst his wives. None of his other wives gave birth to any children. He did have a, uh, a slave girl, Maria, who gave birth to Ibrahim. And Ibrahim passed away when he was 16 months old, when he was a year and a half old, or 18 months old. So Maria, uh, who was gifted to him by the king of Egypt, the Coptic king of Egypt, uh, he gifted Maria to the Prophet sallallahu Maria was not a wife of the Prophet sallallahu She never, she was never married. She remained uh, uh, the, uh, as a slave girl. So she gave birth to Ibrahim. As for all of the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu none of them gave birth to any children. None of them gave birth to any children other than Khadija. So Khadija is the only wife of the Prophet sallallahu to bear him children. How many children? Scholars have differed. Some say six, some say seven, some say eight. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a controversy here. Uh, we all know, scholar, and why is there controversy? Because in those days, as many of you probably know, uh, having a child die at a young age was very common. Very common. In fact, it's only very recently, you can say in the last 70, 80 years, where when a child is born, you expect it to live, right? If you ask your own grandmothers, you ask your own ancestors of ah, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, it's understood one out of every two or three or four is going to die. It's under statistic that is known to them, that they know this is going to happen. In our times, we take it for granted because of, alhamdulillah, the advancements that we've made in technology. We take it for granted, basically, that every child will survive. In those days, it was very, very common. It's understood that uh, one out of every few children is going to pass away when they fall sick, when something happens. So because of this, we don't know the quantity of children Khadija had. We are certain about a number of them. Number one is Qasim. And this was the firstborn and he died before the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet. He died before the Prophet ﷺ became 40. So the Prophet ﷺ was 25 when he married Khadija. Qasim died within the first five, six years of marriage. We don't know anything about him other than his name. Not one detail we know about him. No age, no nothing, because nobody narrated him. But because of Qasim, the Prophet's kunya became Abu al-Qasim, right? By the way, Khadija's kunya was not Umm al-Qasim because she had an older son. And what was that son's name? You should all know by now. Hind. So Khadija's kunya is Umm Hind. Khadija's kunya is Umm Hind. Um, the oldest daughter of the Prophet was Zainab. And Zainab married Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah. Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah is Zainab's cousin. Khadija's older sister Hala, the very one who introduced her to the Prophet ﷺ. Khadija's older sister Hala had a son, Abu al-As. And Abu al-As married Zainab. And so the first cousins married one another. Okay, they are uh, cousins from the maternal aunt, right? And so Khadija's sister, the two of them, their children marry. Okay, uh, Zainab and Abu al-As. The second daughter is Ruqayya. And Ruqayya was initially engaged to the son of Abu Lahab before the coming of Islam. Tabbatila Abu Lahab, the same Abu Lahab, right? That of infamous Tabbatila Abu Lahab fame. Uh, she was engaged to the son of Utba, son of uh, Abu Lahab Utba, Ibn Abi Lahab. And when the Prophet began preaching, in fact, not just Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum. So the third daughter is Umm Kulthum. So we have Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum. Both of them were engaged to the sons of Abu Lahab. And Abu Lahab is, before the coming of Islam, a very uh, powerful person. He is a very famous person. He is a very noble person in that he's about to become the leader of the Quraysh, etc., etc. And so this is a very good match. Abu Lahab tells his sons, you are not going to marry the daughters of 
my nephew. You're not going to marry their daughters. And so he breaks off the marriage completely. And uh, Ruqayya eventually marries Uthman ibn Affan and she dies in the Battle of Badr. So Ruqayya died right after the Battle of Badr. In fact, when the Prophet returned, that was when Ruqayya was, uh, was buried. And in fact, because Ruqayya was so sick, the Prophet told Uthman ibn Affan, you remain behind, don't come to Badr. He wanted to come. He wanted to come. He said, remain behind, take care of my daughter, take care of Ruqayya. So Uthman did not participate in Badr because of the Prophet's daughter Ruqayya. And she died right when the Prophet returned. That was the only sad news that Badr was pure joy, one good thing after another. Badr was the biggest victory ever uh, in the early history of Islam. There was only one negative thing that happened and that was the death of Ruqayya when they came back. And so the Prophet ﷺ, when Ruqayya died, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, gave his third daughter who was not married at the time, Umm Kulthum. He gave Umm Kulthum to Uthman and Uthman therefore became the only person in the history of humanity to have ever married two daughters of a Prophet. No human being had ever married two daughters of a Prophet. Uh, Umm Kulthum then married Uthman ibn Affan and Umm Kulthum also died in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She died in the ninth year of the Hijrah. So Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum both were buried by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Both of his daughters uh, died in his lifetime. Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum. The youngest daughter is of course Fatima. Fatima is his youngest daughter and she was born five years before the revelation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the Prophet was 35 years old and she died six months after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She died six months after the death of the Prophet It appears that the only child of the Prophet who outlived him was Zainab. Zainab lived a little bit longer. Uh, Fatima died within six months of the death of the Prophet After Fatima, this is where the confusion starts. Did Khadija have more sons besides Qasim? So we know she had at least one son, that is Abdullah. And many say he was born in Islam, i.e. after the Prophet reached the age of 40. Some people also add At-Tayyib and At-Tahir. You must have heard of these names. At-Tayyib and At-Tahir. Whereas it appears to be, and this is Allah knows best, the strongest position, At-Tayyib and At-Tahir are names of Abdullah or descriptions of Abdullah. And this therefore makes six children of the Prophet from Khadija. Qasim, the four daughters, and Abdullah. Right? And Allah knows best. But At-Tayyib and At-Tahir are not separate children, but rather nicknames or titles or descriptions because they mean the pure and they mean the nice. And so At-Tayyib and At-Tahir, Allah knows best, but these are also the same as Abdullah. Uh, we don't have much information about, as we said, Khadija during the early phase. All that we have is one or two ahadith. And uh, of these ahadith, it shows us the status of Khadija. In Sahih Bukhari, in Sahih Bukhari, Jibreel came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said after he had left that Jibreel has told me to give you his salams and to tell you the glad tidings that you will have a house in Jannah made out of corals, made out of a precious stone that will not have any noise or any tiredness in it. Now in Arabic, it sounds much more beautiful. وَبَشَّرَهَا بِبَيْتٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ مِنْ قَصَبٍ لَا صَخَبَ فِيهَا وَلَا نَصَبٍ مِنْ قَصَبٍ لَا صَخَبَ فِيهَا وَلَا نَصَبٍ Now in English, it really it loses that beauty. But the point is, three things are mentioned. Number one, the house is made out of very beautiful material, coral or something expensive. Number two, the house will be free of two things. And this shows us that these two things must have been present in her household. And that is why in Jannah, she will not have to worry about these two. The first of them is uh, pressure, if you like, or noise or trial. And scholars have interpreted this to mean that it was a very worrisome atmosphere because of the pressures of Mecca. That there's a lot of internal pressure. And so Khadija always has to calm the Prophet ﷺ down. And so in Jannah, she won't have to worry about that. And the second of them is that you're not going to get tired. So there's a lot of things going on. Now, why would she be tired when she's so wealthy? It's obviously not because she's running after money, but rather she's tired in 
taking care of the affairs of the Prophet ﷺ in response to the pressures around him. That she's always in turmoil, in stress is a better word maybe, right? That she's always in stress because the Prophet ﷺ is stressed. Like any good wife, like any good spouse, she cannot be at peace when her husband is not at peace. And so Allah is telling her, when you get to Jannah, you don't have to worry about that. So this shows us that on this earth, Khadija was always under pressure. In our times, we call it stress, right? In this, on this earth, Khadija is always under pressure. So that when she gets to Jannah, that pressure will be lifted up for us. And another beautiful hadith about uh, Khadija, and we only have, we have so much more left, but we only have five, 10 minutes of time. So I'll have to wrap it up quickly. Uh, another very beautiful hadith about Khadija, radiallahu uh, anha. And before I mention this hadith, let me mention another hadith that shows us comparing between Khadija and other companions. The Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, this is in Medina, many, many years after Khadija. The Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba that uh, you should uh, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your salawat. And so when they would pray, when they sat down for a tahiyyat, one of the things that they would say is, Assalamu ala Allah. Like we say, Assalamu alaikum and Assalamu ala so and so, they would say, Assalamu ala Allah. The Prophet said, You cannot say Assalamu ala Allah. I mean, I've heard of new Muslims when they're really happy, they say, Jazakallah khair ya Allah. You don't say Jazakallah khair ya Allah. Allah is the one that. What do you mean, Jazakallah khair? I mean, it's nonsensical, right? You, you don't say Jazakallah khair. I mean, you know, you understand what I'm saying here, right? Jazakallah khair. Allah is the one giving you jaza. How can you give him back jaza? Right? So innocent people or people who don't think through, like the Sahaba, Assalamu alaikum ya Allah. Allah is coming. The salam comes from Allah. How can you send salam upon Allah? But the point is, even the Sahaba, right? When they were told to praise Allah, they said, Assalamu ala Allah. The Prophet said, You cannot say Assalamu ala Allah. Rather, you must praise Allah. At tahiyyatu lillah wa salawatu wa tayyibat. Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabi. You don't say assalamu ala Allah. So that's where we learn at tahiyyat from. He taught them, you don't praise Allah in this manner. You cannot say assalamu ala Allah or jazakallah khair. You cannot say that to Allah. You must say at tahiyyatu lillah wa salawatu wa tayyibat, etc, etc. Okay, that's hadith way back 10, 15 years again. Let's back forward, fast forward. Let's rewind. Go back to Mecca. In the house of Aish, in the house of Khadija, Jibreel comes and the Prophet ﷺ can see Jibreel. Khadija never saw Jibreel. Uh, one, in one report it is said she saw him, but the more authentic report, she never saw Jibreel. Jibreel comes to the Prophet wasallam, and Jibreel is in the room. And the Prophet wasallam, tells Khadija, O oh Khadija, Allah has sent Jibreel down in order to give you his salams. Jibreel came down to basically send Allah's salams on Khadija. That's the reason why Jibreel came down. Now, why did I mention that hadith? To show you the difference between the men of Medina and this woman of Mecca. How much intelligence this lady had. When she hears Allah is sending salam, the natural response is to say wa alaykum as salam. But you cannot say wa alaykum as salam to Allah. Because, why? Exactly what Khadija said. What did Khadija say? Inna Allaha huwa salam. Allah is a salam. I cannot say wa alayka salam, O Allah. Allah is a salam. One of the names of Allah is a salam. A salam comes from Allah. All peace comes from Allah. All serenity comes from Allah. Inna Allaha huwa salam. That is how she praised Allah back. Allah is a salam. Wa ala Jibreel a salam. And my salams upon Jibreel. You can say a salam alayka Jibreel, right? And then she added, so she sends praise to Allah. She sends salam upon the messenger of Allah, meaning here Jibreel. And then she says, وَعَلَيْكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ سَلَامُ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَتُهُ And upon you, Ya Rasulullah, Allah, salam and rahmah of Allah as well. You cannot think of a more perfect response coming from a lady who hasn't been taught. It's coming from her intelligence. This really shows us how intelligent this lady is. Without being taught advanced aqidah and theology, she knows. You cannot say, Wa alayka salam, oh Allah. She says, Inna Allah huwa salam. Wa ala Jibreel as salam. Wa alayka ya Rasulullah, salamullahi wa rahmatuh. Salam wa alayka wa rahmatullah. So she adds rahma to her husband and she is, and, and he is the messenger of Allah. 
We really don't have much information at all, as we said. I mean, we've given an hour lecture, so believe me, this is pretty much all information that we have about Khadija. Just a little bit, tidbits here and there. All that we know is that she died at a very, very difficult time for the Prophet wasallam. The time was so difficult and it was so traumatic that that year was called the year of grief and the year of sorrow. The death of Khadija was so traumatic for the Prophet ﷺ, that that year is called the year of grief, the year of sorrow. Because the Prophet ﷺ became so griefed, so in grief because of it. Why? What happened in that year? Three things happened. Each one of them was worse than the last. And the last was the most difficult. Number one was the rejection of Ta'if. The rejection of Ta'if was one of the most difficult things for the Prophet ﷺ to bear. And you all know the story and I'm not going to mention it here. If you don't know, you should read about it. And Aisha, many years later, said to the Prophet ﷺ, what was the worst day of your life? He said, the day of Ta'if. That was the most difficult day of my life. What was the most, not, I shouldn't say the worst, the most difficult day. What was the most difficult day? The, the, uh, the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, the day of the re re rejection of Ta'if. Within a few weeks after that, his uncle Abu Talib dies. And that was a very big loss. Because Abu Talib was the main protector amongst men of the Prophet ﷺ. Within five, six weeks, in the month of Ramadan, three years before the emigration to Medina, Khadija dies. And that was the most difficult of all of these. So much so that a number of companions reported that they became worried for the Prophet ﷺ. Abdullah ibn Umair, he said, the Prophet ﷺ was so grieved at the death of Khadija that we became worried for him. In other words, he was not seen normally, regularly. He was very sad. He was very much in a loss. Khawala bint Hakim, another famous companion. The other lady sent her to the Prophet ﷺ to cheer him up. And she said, O Messenger of Allah, you, I see that you have cut yourself off from others because of the loss of Khadija. In other words, you're living in isolation. What we call in our times, it's a bit of a shock. It's a bit of a, he, he just wants to be alone. And, she, and he says, yes, she was the caretaker of the family. She was my companion. In other, in other words, he admits that the loss of Khadija is so difficult for me that yes, I'm not living like I, I, I usually would. And it was that loss and it was that grief that encouraged the other Sahaba to go and say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you need to get married. You have to get married again. And that was when he then married Sauda and Aisha after that. Because the loss of Khadija was so much, they could see the grief in his face. And that was when the Prophet ﷺ began marrying other women. And of the signs and specialities of Khadija is that he never married any woman uh, other than Khadija. When Khadija was alive, it was only later on he married other wives. And this is of the blessings of Khadija as well. That Khadija lived with him the longest and as his only wife. She lived with him the entire basically Meccan period from the age of 25 up until the age of 50. That's 25 years. Aisha only had uh, 8 or 9 years with the Prophet ﷺ. And all the other women had less than this. Some of them only had 2-3 years with him Wasallam. Khadija had 25 years all to herself. He never even thought of marrying another woman. Because Khadija was his, uh, that, that much of a beloved wife. Khadija, the same, after the death of Khadija, still his love for Khadija continued to show. And in Medina, when any type of food would come to him, he would send some of that food to the friends and relatives of Khadija. He loved her so much that whenever he got some meat and he loved, وسلم, he loved the, uh, the leg of a lamb, he loved it. Anytime he would get this precious prize, he would order some of it to be cut and sent to the neighbors and the friends of Khadija. In other words, I mean, and, and imagine now, this is his way of reminiscing of Khadija, remembering Khadija, that if Khadija were here, this is what I would do. So he sends it to the friends of Khadija. And once somebody visited the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a very old lady visited, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was extremely hospitable and kind to her and asking about her and how she's doing and how her friends and relatives are, and then she left. Aisha said, O Messenger of Allah, this old Bedouin lady, why so much hospitality? So the Prophet ﷺ said, she was a friend of Khadija's. Just being nice to the friend of Khadija. And even seeing an item that belonged to Khadija, it visibly shook him. In 
uh, in the famous uh, incident, again, it's a long story here, but uh, in, the, in the battle of uh, Badr, basically, in the battle of uh, Badr, one of the people who was captured was, uh, was Hala, the nephew of Khadija, and the son-in-law of the Prophet, Abu al-As, excuse me, Abu al-As, the son of Hala. Abu al-As, the son of Hala. So Abu al-As was actually fighting along with the Quraysh against the Muslims. And by the way, just a, a, a FYI, again, a tangent here. Abu al-As was never an enemy to Islam, but his family forced him to fight. And that is why he was of the first to surrender. He did not want to fight. He, he was forced to fight and he was never an enemy to Islam. And he was uh, also initially, eventually converted to Islam. Abu al-As was caught in the battle of Badr. And as you all know, all of the prisoners had to be ransomed. And so the message went back that everybody has to send ransom for the prisoners who are there. Now who's going to send the ransom for Abu al-As? Well, along with his family, also the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And so she gave a necklace of hers that Khadija had given her on her marriage day to Abu al-As. And so she sent the necklace that Khadija used to wear to ransom her own husband. Now, it's the situation now for us, it might be very strange. Why is she in Mecca, etc.? You need to understand, she didn't want to stay in Mecca. There's family pressure here. There, Hijra has not been made obligatory. There's a long story. Uh, I cannot answer all of that right now. But the point being, there's things going on that people are being forced to do. Abu al-Az did not want to fight, right? Uh, similarly, uh, Ruqayya did not, uh, sorry, Zainab did not want to be in Mecca, but there was family pressure to remain in Mecca. Now, to be fair, everybody has to be ransomed, so the Prophet is sending the ransom uh, to everybody. So, uh, sorry, Zainab, Zainab. Zainab sends her portion of the ransom. Part of her portion is the necklace her own mother used to wear, i.e., Khadija. And the Sahabi who's narrating the hadith, he said, when the ransom came, when the Prophet ﷺ saw this necklace, we could see the grief on his face. We could see how it melted him. You can imagine he's remembering his wife Khadija and she would dress up in this necklace and all of that love and all of those memories is coming back. And it affected him so much that uh, the people who had basically Abu al-As, they agreed to give him back for nothing. Go, take the necklace and go. It's something that he's so much affected by when he sees the necklace of Khadija. How can you possibly take this necklace now? And so they sent him back with the necklace without taking the ransom. And the condition that he put upon Abu al-As, you must send my daughter back. And so he got much more than the necklace. He got the wearer of the necklace, i.e. his daughter back. And eventually Abu al-As uh, accepted Islam way before the conquest of Mecca. So he also accepted Islam. Khadija, even after her death, she remained a presence in the household of the Prophet ﷺ. So much so that Aisha, this young girl Aisha, Aisha never saw Khadija because she was too young. Aisha does not remember Khadija at all. Aisha and Khadija never met in the sense that I'm sure Khadija would have seen Aisha as a baby, but she never, Aisha does not remember Khadija at all. Yet Aisha says, I was never as jealous of any of the wives of the Prophet as much as I was for Khadija, even though I never saw her. This is what Aisha is saying. I never saw her, but I was never more jealous of any woman than Khadija. Why? Because the Prophet kept on going on and on and on about her. لِكَثْرَةِ ذِكْرِهَا Every time he'd mention her. I couldn't stand it. If um, some gift came, he'd send it to Khadija's relatives, right? If uh, meat came, he'd give it to her, her neighbors. Once, she says, Hala came to visit. Who's Hala? Khadija. Khadija's sister. And she said, Assalamu alaikum, can I come in? And the Prophet, ﷺ, his whole demeanor changed because he recognized Khadija's voice. When Hala came, he, she, it was as if Khadija was there. And Aisha could not bear to see that grief. So as soon as Hala left, she let it out. <laughs> Only one time because she learned her lesson that time. She said, Ya Rasulullah, for how long? Are you going to continue mentioning some old lady whose cheeks are falling out? Meaning that Khadija was much older than her. Aisha, mashallah, she's a 17 year old. And Khadija, she was 60 years old when she passed away, right? For how long are you going to continue mentioning some old lady who was toothless and she has cheeks falling? In other words, she was quite crude in her description. And Allah has given you someone far prettier than her, far better than her. The Prophet became angry. 
How dare you insult Khadija? The Prophet became angry. And she said, La, and he said, La wallahi. No, by Allah. Allah did not give me someone better than her. How dare you say that you're better than her just because you're prettier and younger? Allah did not give me somebody better than her. She believed in me when nobody else believed in me. You didn't have that privilege, Aisha, right? She believed in me when nobody else believed in me. And she gave me of her money when everybody had rejected me. And she gave me children when none of my other wives has given me children. And she supported me when all of society rejected me, right? In other words, don't say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given someone better than you. Aisha, narrating the hadith, she said, I learned my lesson and I never criticized her after that. She got her rebuke back that, don't say this, right? I learned my lesson and I never criticized her after that. And the Prophet wasallam, and with this hadith we'll basically uh, conclude, uh, the Prophet wasallam once drew four lines on the sand, high up, far away. And he said, do you know what these four are? They said, what? He said, these are the four best women ever. On, that Allah has created. These are the four best women. Number one, and he began with her, Khadija binti Khuwaylid. He began with her. And then he said, Fatima, my daughter. And then he said, Asiya binti Muzahim, the wife of Fir'aun. And then he said, Maryam ibn Atu Imran, the mother of Isa. And another hadith in Tirmidhi, he said, many are the men who have perfected their iman. But in the history of the world, only four women have perfected their iman. And the same four are mentioned. Khadija binti Khuwaylid is one of those who has perfected their iman. And really this shows us that, and you, know, you all know the saying that behind every great man there must be a great woman. Wallahi, this is not a cliched statement, it is dead true. A man, no matter how much of an ego, no matter how much of a charisma, no matter how much of a personality he has, Allah has created a man that he, he needs a supporting wife if, he want, if he's going to be successful. He needs a wife that will support him in every single way, emotionally, psychologically. And if that is not there, then it is really almost impossible for a man to be successful. If he cannot be successful in his house, if his wife is not giving him a, 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 a household of support and comfort and, and, and confidence, he's not going to be successful outside of the house. And this is very true. And our scholars from the earliest of times have always said this, that for somebody like the Prophet Allah needed to find and choose the best woman. And that is why he chose Khadija. Khadija was the best woman because she needed to be the best wife in order for our Prophet wasallam to be who he was. This really shows us uh, the, 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 the power really and the, and the blessings of being such a perfect wife. No matter all of the pressures that the Prophet ﷺ had outside of him in his household, he had this loving wife, this comforting wife who would support him, who would put her confidence and her trust in him. And that allowed him to overcome all of these problems that he faced outside of the household. And it is so true. And if you read any book of also human psychology and marriage and whatnot, it is so true that when a man has a, a, a loving and supportive and confident wife, this gives him the confidence and the support that he needs to be uh, successful outside of the household. We see this in the life of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he himself said, the very best blessing that any man can be given is a righteous wife. And so don't you think that Allah would have given him the very best blessing that he deserved and that is why he deserved and he got a woman as beautiful and as powerful and as noble as his wife Khadija. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to learn from her morals, her characteristics, her lessons. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for you, may he allow you all to be in the company of his wives and our mothers uh, Khadija and his other wives. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuhu Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.